This is case number J1403, <coughs> IA 2009, let me make a correction. Case number J1403, MS 2009-00009, State of Arizona, versus Stephen Anderson, who's present, represented by counsel. Happy birthday. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> and Mr. Katz, on behalf of the state, is present, and I don't know who you are, but you My can name is Scott yourself. Campbell. I work for Mr. I just wanted the court to be aware that uh, Mr. Campbell is here and that Mr. Campbell will be assisting me uh, throughout today's hearing and then, uh, if necessary, the uh, jury trial tomorrow. Now, any preliminary um, matters that we need to address prior to beginning this hearing? I think we do have a preliminary matter. Uh, I don't know if it's, a, uh, if it's a serious matter or not, but I wanted to bring it to the court's attention. Uh, Mr. Katz informed me uh, recently, uh, I think it was by telephone, that um, there's a potential issue that uh, could be a conflict for the court. Mr. Katz communicated to me um, that the court has a connection with a prosecutor in the Yuma City, City of Yuma Prosecutor's Office. Uh, Mr. Anderson has an unrelated case in that office right now. So I don't know uh, if there's a conflict. I don't know if that is true or what. So I thought I would inquire uh, with the court to find out exactly if there is a conflict, what the nature, what the extent is, and sort of get it out, get it on the record. And so we would then know about it. Um, and then if the court feels there's no conflict, we can then maybe take a break and discuss and see if we agree with that and then move forward or take other appropriate action if necessary. Okay. Very well. I, I think in, uh, Mr. Katz is referring, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, he's referring to uh, the city prosecutor, Mr. Kearns, Jay Kearns, uh, has an assistant or uh, someone that works with him on a on and off basis, and that happens to be my husband. Um, my husband uh, is aware that I am the judge in this case. My husband has not dealt with any issues related to any case that, uh, and I, I don't know, I, I didn't know that there was any case in city court or anything um, in that court, but it, he He's not involved in any cases. He covers for Mr. J. Kearns. Um, he's covering actually this week because Mr. Kearns is on vacation and they have uh, worked together for many years. Um, and that's the extent of uh, <coughs> the, the possible uh, conflict, if you find it is a conflict. The court has no uh, problem here in this case. The court um, will be fair and impartial, um, and I don't think that there's any, any anything to um, to be concerned about. Uh, and I will give you some time to talk to your client to discuss it um, along with the prosecutor um, if, if you need so. Can the state be heard, Your Honor? Mm -hmm. Um, ultimately, Your Honor, the state's not taking a position um, one way or another on this issue. Um, the state's prosecutor myself learned on or about uh, the week of December 4th, 2009, that your husband, Mr. Greg Torok, does prosecute cases on a contractual basis uh, for the city of Yuma. Um, I felt that it was incumbent upon myself to inform Mr. Victor of that uh, upon learning that. Um, and. Your Honor, um, although the state is not taking a position concerning this issue, the state does want to make clear that if the defendant does decide to go forward with this case, um, and this case were to be resolved upon a jury verdict not in the defendant's favor, the state will be arguing that any issue on appeal concerning any appearance of impropriety has been waived by the defendant knowingly proceeding. Uh, and in doing this, Your Honor, the state will just point to a couple sources that we, to create a record that could potentially be reviewed 
so that all the parties are on the same page. There's a 1980 Arizona opinion from the Attorney General, and it looks like the citation is um, 1980 Arizona OP dot ATTY dot General 115, Attorney General Opinion Number I80-139, uh, July 23, 1980. Um, and it looks like it's concerning uh, the Honorable Jim Hardigan, and it's some sort of letter that's been written, what appears to be uh, from the Arizona Attorney General, I, I suppose. And it is not directly on point, but it does elaborate on some of the issues that have been raised by defense counsel, and I think that perhaps this could focus the discussion. Um, it involved a town magistrate whose husband or wife was the town chief of police here in Arizona. Now, although it's not directly on point, there were two conflicts that were identified by the Arizona Attorney General's opinion. One was a statutory conflict of interest, and I don't think that statutory conflict of interest applies to this case. The other source of the conflict of interest was brought forth by the formal, excuse me, the, I believe it was the former Canon 3 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. And I'm not sure if it's enacted in its current form, but this is a predecessor to what I believe is today Rule 1.2. Concerning the Code of Judicial Conduct, um, it, and I'll read in order to pr produce this cogently. Canon 3 of the Code, Canon 3 of the Code is entitled, A Judge Should Perform the Duties of His Office Impartially and Diligently. Under A1 of Adjudicated Responsibilities, a judge should be unswayed by partisan interest. And the state is not alleging that, Your Honor. The state is, is not putting that forth whatsoever. Under Part C, Disqualification, a judge should disqualify himself in a proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Once again, the state is not taking a position. This is just a framework for the intellectual inquiry before the court. Among the situations in which a judge should disqualify himself are cases where he has a personal bias or prejudice concerning a party, where he knows that his spouse has a financial or any other interest that could substantially be affected by the outcome of the proceeding, or where his spouse is an officer of a party to the proceeding or has an interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. And I think particularly focusing on that last provision where the the spouse is an officer of a party to the proceeding or has an interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome. Um, I think that's the key clause within this Attorney General's opinion, Your Honor. And although these cases are distinct, the case in the city court and the case before Your Honor today, they did, the circumstances, the factual circumstances, I believe, begin on August 5th, the date at which you began to preside over these proceedings. It's alleged that um, at some sort of establishment in Yuma, Mr. Anderson and some of his friends or supporters engaged in certain conduct. Those are allegations. Um, the identification of Mr. Anderson is made by a victim in the case as having had contact with Mr. Anderson previously as he discussed the facts and circumstances of this case, Your Honor. The victim in this case of the city uh, went on to explain that Mr. Anderson has detailed to her before and she recognized him as having a Border Patrol case pending in Yuma County and that he was returning to court at 1 p.m. And that's how she was able to identify him. Just to frame the intellectual inquiry, Mr. Greg Torok is an agent of the state. Mr. Greg Torok has, um, is an officer of a party, the state of Arizona, Your Honor. The state of Arizona is present in the courtroom today. It's state versus Stephen Anderson in the county proceeding. I, I don't know how Ultimately, Mr. An uh, Mr. Victor will resolve this, but some of these same issues, the mere agency and the mere fact that Mr. Torok appears frequently on behalf of the state of Arizona and actually appears is covering the entire week. And I don't know if that means he has accessibility to the city prosecutor's office, resources, things like that. I don't know and I can't speculate. The state's position is, is that if the defendant waives this potential conflict, this cannot be raised on appeal. It's a knowing waiver. I, it, one thing that I think that we um, need to consider, in, in, and I'm sure that you, you're acquainted with everything that Mr. Katz read, and I'm sure he's doing it for purposes of the record, that the, the, the mere fact that Mr. Kearns, and I'm assuming that that's how your office found out of, of anything uh, in related to any other case pending, is by Mr. Kearns, who is a uh, 
very diligent attorney. He has been an attorney in Yuma County for many years. He's a defense lawyer. Uh, is a prosecutor for the city uh, that diligently called uh, the prosecutor's office, let them know, and uh, having seen Mr. Kern's work, um, I have to assume that he, he did it because he wanted to make sure that your office was aware that Mr. Torak will not be involved, knowing that I'm the judge uh, presiding in this, in this case. Um, one thing for you, uh, Mr. Victor, because I know that you have expressed your concern in regards to delays. I know you're concerned about your, your client having to travel to, uh, to Yuma, and um, in this case is being delayed for, for many reasons, and uh, um, I'm sure the parties want to make sure that this case is finalized and, and that you do have a fair and impartial judge, one thing to consider may be the transfer of that case to the prosecutor's office. Um, so there won't be any conflict then. There's been cases that there have been transferred, uh, whether to the city for Mr. Kearns to take care, and Mr. Kearns have been in this court taking care of cases for the county, and the same thing can happen with that case. And, and then, and I don't know the status of that, that case, I don't know what's the stage of it, but if it's a case where there's just allegations, uh, still the county, or the case can be transferred because of possible conflict. Um, and Your Honor, um, I'm not familiar with whether that is occurring or not. Um, but the conflict is before the court, and Your Honor, respectfully, it, it is Your Honor's conflict on this case with the appearance. Um, the possible remedy, I, I don't think, if that hasn't been negotiated at this time, I don't think that that's on the table before these proceedings, that it could be conflicted like that. Um, well, I don't know, and you don't know I don't either. know either. I think that uh, uh, one thing that Mr. Victor uh, has to consider is all his options for the, in the interest of his clients Justice, um, in, in more than anything, uh, his clients uh, in the interest of justice for um, Mr. Anderson. In the interest of judicial economy, I think that we already extend that um, in a way that I've never seen uh, a case um, taking this long to be resolved when we're talking about a class two and a class three misdemeanor offense. But that's besides the point. Um, the court, once again, I don't have any problem um, dealing with this case, hearing this case, um, and if I did, I will recuse myself. Uh, if I felt that I wouldn't be fair and impartial to Mr. Anderson, I will recuse myself. Um, and one other thing that you may want to about is, is the stage of that case. I don't know if, if you if you know your point of view representing him on that case, um, to know what is the extent of that case have been, um, that Mr. Torak has been familiar with, and it, it's, it's up to you at this point. I will give you uh, as much time as you need to discuss with your client. We dedicated this day to hear this case. Um, so it, it, it's, it's up to you, but I do agree with the state in regards to you um, deciding that there's no conflict, that you're okay with this court here in this case, that you will be waiving, um, you know, bringing anything up in regards to any um, conflict. Um, if you're not satisfied with the, the rulings of the court, um, obviously we haven't heard anything regarding the motion and uh, and, and Mr. Victor, Your Honor, the, the state's not making any assurances or guarantees that there would be any conflict of the conflicting of the case from the city to the county. I, I simply don't know the status of those discussions between uh, the leadership of my office and the leadership of the city. So the state's not making any guarantees or assurances that Mr. Anderson's case would be moved to the county. I simply don't know. Judge, I think uh, <clears throat> more has been made of this issue than it really deserves. I've spoken with Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Anderson 
uh, is not asking me, nor is it my wish, uh, to try to change judges at this point. It seems like the state has spent lots of time uh, to establish the uh, fundamental notion that a knowing waiver of an issue can't be raised on appeal. Of course, that's the case, Judge. We don't take issue with that. Uh, I'm not convinced we even have an issue here. That was the reason for my inquiry at the beginning, to find out uh, what the facts are. The court has reported the facts that the court wasn't even uh, aware of this case, doesn't know anything about it. court doesn't have any information about anything in regards to that case. Uh, I don't see any conflict here whatsoever. Um, so I agree with the state that you know, if we waive the issue to the extent it's an issue at all, that it's not something we can raise on appeal. I certainly agree with that. State is also saying that the state doesn't have any issue with this court, uh, this court's ability to be fair and impartial. At least that is the state's position today. Um, that's not been the state's position in the past. But uh, we've never had any issue with that. I'm not hearing anything, uh, nor am I aware of anything, that uh, would cause me to think that this court can't be fair and impartial in regards to Mr. Anderson and his case and the issues before the court. So with that said, Judge, um, if anything changes, if the court was to come into different information, new information, uh, I would certainly expect um, that the court would raise that issue at that point, and we could deal with it at that point if it ever becomes an issue. But at this point, it doesn't sound like we have an issue. We're not asking for a change of judge. And uh, I think we should just proceed with the issues that are on the table today. This is the time set for a motion to suppress. And this uh, motion was filed on September 23rd, 2009, there's been a response by the state, October 5th, 2009, and a message to that response on October 9th. Uh, the issues to address the, the motion uh, specifically wants to suppress the issue of the seizure of, of Mr. Anderson's body by Border Patrol agents as, as it was illegal seizure in violation of the Fourth Amendment, Amendment of the United States and along with that the refusal to obey these officers' orders to relocate his vehicle and himself as the order was a continued illegal seizure of his body and he was permitted to passively refuse to obey the order as a matter of law. Um, is the state ready to proceed? Uh, Your Honor, the state is ready. Um, the state is uh, concerned about, respectfully, Your Honor's framing of the two issues with regard to this suppression motion. Your Honor, um, it's quite clear that Mr. Victor is challenging the constitutionality of Interstate 8 Mile Marker 78's checkpoint. Um, I believe I heard referenced uh, in the framing of these issues before the court by Your Honor that also that Mr. Whether, whether Mr. Anderson was entitled to passively refuse to comply. Um, are those, does Your Honor con contend or assert that those issues are before the court in this pretrial motion? Did, did you read the motion? I did, and Your Honor, you don't, you don't agree with that. I don't, I don't agree whatsoever that the issue of whether Mr. Anderson is entitled to passively refuse is in any way apropos of a pretrial motion, Your Honor. And, and in numerous pleadings, the parties have debated this. That is a factual defense, a potential factual defense. I, I'm not going to afford that defense any merit within this presentation. That's a potential factual defense that might possibly be raised at trial, whether he can passively refuse. Um, the issue before the court on the suppression motion, Your Honor, and I believe uh, State versus Nijak and State versus Kerr and Rule 16.6b, this court cannot consider factual defenses in a pretrial setting. This court can certainly consider whether the checkpoint was constitutional in a pretrial setting, in a suppression motion, and acquisition of evidence, and whether it, it complies with Martinez Fuerte, its progeny in the Fourth Amendment. But this court, respectfully, Your Honor, cannot consider factual defenses. There is no such authorization in the law to raise factual defenses in a constructive or pseudo rule or motion for summary judgment. There is no motion for summary judgment in that regard, Your Honor. 
And with regard to that second prong of the inquiry, the state does disagree that that is not the inquiry before the court today. I'm going to let Mr. Campbell address that issue, Judge. Your Honor, motion to suppress for the Fourth Amendment would be to suppress the seizure of his body and under the fruits of the poisonous tree doctrine to suppress any fruits of that seizure. Uh, if he was illegally seized uh, in the roadway and they directed him to go to the secondary inspection station, uh, that would simply be an illegal seizure over there rather than an illegal seizure here. It would be a fruit of the orig original uh, seizure. Um, I believe I briefed it in the motion that the current state of Arizona law is you cannot violently resist an officer who is making an illegal arrest or in this case perpetuating an illegal seizure. And there's no um, allegations that he resisted the officers. He's not charged with resisting arrest. So um, the fact that he, again, he was asked to be illegal, he was told to be illegally seized over there than over here is simply fruits of the poisonous tree, and I think it's within the purview of this court to determine that in the motion to suppress. So the, the issue will be whether the, the search, the seizure was illegal or not within the Fourth Amendment, and if the court determines that it was not, then the fruit which is his refusal, um, will have to be addressed then. Yes, Your Honor. And Your Honor, I would agree more with the framing of the issue in that sense, um, in classic terms and concepts as presented by counsel. But Your Honor, the state will re-urge at, at this instance that um, we're about to embark on a hearing, and as professed by defense counsel at an earlier hearing, that could take all day. Um, this hearing is amounting to, potentially, a bench trial before a jury trial, Your Honor. The state has brought forth to Your Honor's attention the cases of, um, I believe it was State versus Tassler and the State versus Windis. And speaking in terms of Fruit of the Poisonous Tree, Juan Son, its progeny, Matt versus Ohio, things like that, um, Your Honor, quite simply, the state at all times, at all times contends that that checkpoint on Interstate 8 and mile marker 78, that checkpoint's constitutional. It's been constitutional for approximately 30 years. That's the state's contention. But for the purposes of an argument or a hypothetical and an inquiry, if Your Honor were to decide that that checkpoint happened to be unconstitutional, Your Honor, under the recent Sup Supreme Court opinion in Herring, which indicates that a defendant doesn't have a right to suppression of fruits, he has to make a policy argument of it. Number one, does it result in appreciable deterrence? So you have the whole herring argument that the state will be bringing forth. Does he even have a remedy under herring and the new posture of the United States Supreme Court with Justice Roberts writing as of 2009? The state argues that he doesn't have a remedy in that sense. But even before that, Your Honor, there's the Tassler and Windis case. And the Tassler and Windis case kind of focus on the idea and one or the other involved, for example, an unlawful entry into a subject's home. Okay. Well, me, Mr. Katzen, uh, respectfully, um, I'll use your favorite word. Um, let's, let's deal with one issue at a time. Let's start this hearing and determine whether uh, this seizure was not within the Fourth Amendment, and then we'll deal with the second uh, part of and, and, and following from that order, Your Honor, and the state will respect that. Typically, I've seen uh, done before in suppression hearings, which particular piece of evidence would Your Honor like the state to focus on as being capable of being suppressed in this case? Mr. Anderson's person, um, potentially, um, I, I don't follow that argument. Defense counsel previously wrote in numerous pleadings that they were seeking the suppression of criminal charges. That's not possible, Your Honor. This court isn't authorized to do that. Defense counsel previously argued that they were uh, arguing for the suppression of subsequent criminal conduct. If the state can be provided with Your Honor of how to focus its questioning and testimony at this hearing of which evidence is the subject of the inquiry, that would help both judicial economy and the presentation of the evidence. Your Honor, and, you? thank you, Your Honor. I think I'll be doing most of this. Okay. Uh, the 
previous motions that Mr. Katz spoke about have been um, handled by the court, and they're not at issue today. So whatever was brought up in those previous issues, I think just doesn't matter today. Your Honor, an arrest is a seizure of a person. The stop at this checkpoint, the state admits, is a seizure of Mr. Anderson's person. And if it's unconstitutional, then you suppress the seizure. Uh, he was, for all intents and purposes, not there. The court doesn't consider it. Just as if the court suppresses uh, the seizure of drugs. Legally, the drugs don't exist in a court of law. And we're asking the court, if the court finds that the checkpoint as it was run on April 14th, violated the Fourth Amendment to suppress the seizure of Mr. Anderson's body because he was seized at that checkpoint. Your Honor, if Mr. Anderson or if any individual, let's assume that individual Jones is stopped at this same checkpoint, and let's assume that this checkpoint is determined by Your Honor to be unconstitutional. If individual Jones, while seized at that checkpoint in primary, when the agent asks for the citizenship identification and status, if individual Jones not alleging that this occurred in this case, of course. If individual Jones shot the primary agent, Your Honor, would defense counsel then argue that since he shouldn't have been stopped, since he shouldn't have been stopped under the Fourth Amendment, therefore that subsequent criminal activity, the homicide of the primary agent should be suppressed? And Your Honor, that's what the Tassler and Windus decisions deal with. This court is not authorized to suppress subsequent independent criminal activity. Mr. Anderson's person is being argued as subsequent criminal activity by the state. Mr. Anderson's criminal activity began after that seizure. You, this court, under Windus and Tassler, cannot suppress subsequent criminal activity. The refusal to go to secondary, the obstruction of the highway, this all occurred after an allegedly invalid seizure. Even if the seizure itself, hypothetically, is determined to be invalid, those subsequent criminal acts exist independently of that, and they are not capable of being suppressed. Just as a person could not take out a gun and shoot the primary agent, Your Honor. Have, did you have an opportunity to read the cases that Mr. Katz is referring to? Um, yes, I did. And I, I know what he's talking about in, in reading the, the motion. To, that was one of the things that, that I it was in my mind when I read this these two cases that he's referring to. Uh, did you have did you have an opportunity to read those cases? I have not read those cases, but using it as an example, Your Honor, um, if Mr. Anderson taken out a gun and shot one of the Border Patrol officers, that's a different tree. That's a separate crime. He's being charged with um, not getting out of the roadway and not going to secondary, each of which is a continues continuation of the original seizure. It is a fruit of the same tree. There's no allegation that he committed a separate crime, simply a continuing series of events that started with the first seizure. Let me, Mr. Katz, and, and I read the cases that you're referring to. Let's start with this here. And, and if it comes to a point where this case is applied to this particular uh, this particular case, the court will will consider that. Uh, let's proceed with this with this hearing. Yes, Your Honor. The, the, state, the state could call its first witness. Okay, and who, who would that be? Uh, Agent uh, Ernest Gomez. Um, okay. It may take a few minutes. We do have the agents um, in a different location. Judge, just. Uh, for purposes of the record, we want to say that we do invoke the rule at this point. So I don't know if the court wants to bring them all in, uh, inform them about their responsibilities, not to talk to each other about the testimony, the case, those types of things, and then send them back out or deal with it one at a time. That's the court's decision. But I just want to make it clear that anybody who's going to be, who's anticipated to be a state's witness for this hearing should be excluded from the testimony in the courtroom. And to make sure that they're all brought in. May I, may I raise a question of law? I, I have a concern. Does the rule of exclusion also apply to state's witnesses that would be testifying at the trial? 
because the state would argue that the presence of any witnesses that will be testifying considering the scope of this hearing should also be subject to exclusion such as defense counsel's character witnesses. It, it, Judge, if, this, this hearing is not the trial. This hearing is a open to the public hearing and so if people are going to testify at this hearing they're subject to the rule. If they're not going to testify at this hearing then they wouldn't be subject to the rule. The trial starts tomorrow and then the issue tomorrow will be if they're going to testify at the trial and the rule is invoked they need to be excluded from the trial. But there is an interest here that's a, a sort of an open forum, American public forum type of an interest. This hearing's open to the public and so if people aren't testifying at this hearing it's, a, it's an overly broad reading of the rule to exclude anybody who may appear at the trial from this pre-trial hearing. The state was asking it more for the purposes of its own witnesses, Your Honor. I've noticed the Yuma County Attorney's investigator, Mr. Derek Shyrock, as a witness at the trial. Mr. Shyrock will not be testifying at the hearing today. He's here in a support and assistance capacity with the technology. So um, with that being the standard, Your Honor, I suppose it seems that Mr. Shyrock can be present and the state's question has been answered. I think so. It, it will, um, Ms. Bailiff, we, were we able to? Yes. We need them all here yes. so they can. Yes. Your Honor, the, uh, the state would ask if I haven't had contact with my case agent this morning, case agent Jones, he could possibly be with the other witnesses. The state would ask as typically done that Agent Jones be permitted to sit with uh, state's counsel. And if Mr. Jones is in the special room, that that be communicated to him that the state requests his presence. May I mark some exhibits while we wait? You may. Uh, marking um, Mr. Mm -hmm. Anderson's uh, <coughs> video from the checkpoint. The full one coming up? Yeah. Right, the hour long one you're talking about. It should be. It should be. Okay. The one he's holding and talking to you. I got you. And then um, also the overhead um, shot of Agent Spillmore indicating secondary in front of the dog. Do you have any exhibits that you would like to be marked? I have none to mark today. I have a question. Your Honor, do you want to 
I need all the uh, the edges. Hey, well. Just go ahead and have a seat. Use the jury, the jury box. In, in when I have all of the, all of the other agents, I'm going to place you all under oath. It may take a while, so you, I don't want you to be standing there. I'm waiting for all the other agents to place them under oath. Oh, I'm sorry. Please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give to this court is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. Okay. Now, officers, um, agents, uh, you, the, the exclusion of witnesses rule has been invoked. Um, and what you're required to do is, you're not going to be in the courtroom, you are ordered not to discuss your testimony among yourselves, to talk about this case among yourselves, you will be called one at a time to testify. Which is the agent that you want uh, sitting in your table, Mr. Katz? Uh, Your Honor, for the purposes of this hearing, Mr. Jones has the option if he wishes to sit at the table, um, although if he prefers to sit in the secured room, it's up to him. Okay. And, and who's Mr. Jones? Officer Jones, I apologize. Okay. Um, you may stay here. And the rest of you will be escorted. Who's your first witness, Mr. Katz? Agent Gomez. Okay, Agent Gom Gomez will remain in the courtroom. And the rest your Honor, may I retract that? I'd like to call Agent Sims. I apologize. Agent Sims. Okay, Agent Simpson, you will remain in the courtroom. The rest of you will be escorted to the private room. Um, 
you first. You can take the witness then. Make sure the microphone is close enough to you so we can hear you properly. Judge, I have an objection before we get started. I want to get out of the way. Okay. Um, Mr. Katz, from what I understand, is intending to play uh, an hour-long video of what occurred at the scene, uh, which may or may not be important if we get to a jury trial just to show the jury the scene. Um, however, for today, uh, this is I think this would be a horrendous waste of time because the agents are here. The agents can testify to exactly what happened, and uh, I don't believe there's going to be anything in those videos um, other than just sort of seeing the scene, which, which might be relevant to things at the jury trial, but is not relevant to the strictly legal issues that the court's dealing with today. And so under 403, um, I would move to not do that today because I think, and to use the language of 403, it's just simply a waste of time. Uh, unless the court fi would find or the court feels there's something in that hour-long video that would assist the court in some way beyond the live testimony and independent recollections of the officers who were there, uh, which I can't possibly think of what would assist the court at that point. I just think it's a huge waste of time to play an hour-long video uh, to, to just establish what the officers are going to establish. Mr. Katz. Your Honor, as a pr procedural formality, I've seen this done many times, and I say this respectfully to counsel at the defense table. Um, for the purposes of, purposes of this hearing, counsel needs to select one representative who will be speaking for the defendant, Your Honor. Uh, that is typical of these hearings. Additionally, Your Honor, um, what better evidence than the crime which was captured by Mr. Anderson himself? Defense counsel either Mr. Victor, or co-counsel, routinely have been raising factual defenses in this pretrial setting, Your Honor. The state thinks that's improper. Uh, what better way to recount the event for Your Honor, the fact finder at this hearing, than for Your Honor to see the video? Your Honor, additionally, this is a video that will be admitted into evidence at the trial where the state will be, uh, has the intention to admit at trial. And perhaps that could serve uh, the dualistic role of reviewing the tape for the trial itself, but it's highly probative. Uh, beginning from the very first moment when Agent Gomez encounters Mr. Anderson and he's videotaping him, and that's where the crime begins, Your Honor. Uh, typically, from what I understand, people when they're allegedly committing their criminal activities don't give the benefit of the court of videotaping it themselves. Your Honor will have a first-hand account of the alleged Fourth Amendment violation that's being proffered by defense counsel. Uh, Your Honor, it's highly probative. It's not a waste of time. It's and it speaks to the fact that it's not a waste of time since Mr. Anderson himself decided to videotape his crimes as they were occurring. He found it probative, Your Honor, and the state finds it probative as well. The objection is silver rule. I, I, I'm interested in seeing that video. Judge, just to respond to the other issue in terms of who's going to speak, um, I've had the privilege of trying several cases with uh, other attorneys, and uh, I've never once been restricted uh, to just sort of one lawyer for the entire proceeding. The restrictions that I, to my recollection, that I have always had are uh, per witness. In other words, one attorney will handle uh, one witness, or will be assigned a particular witness, and then if they choose to have a different attorney to handle a different witness, that's fine. So we don't intend to have both of us asking questions of the same witnesses. Um, we intend to have one attorney, which could be me, could be Mr. Campbell, uh, for each witness. That's how we would intend to proceed. I don't think anything's inappropriate about that. I, I'm and your not Honor. concerned about that. I, I, and I think Mr. Katz um, addressed it in a, in a way that I um, wasn't sure if, if he wanted me to request that you assign one um, attorney to be the one speaking all the time, or I, I don't have any problem at all. And Your Honor, um, does that also apply to one attorney making opening and closing remarks concerning the constitutionality of the search, or will Mr. Victor be able to give his opinion on the constitutionality at the close of these proceedings as well as co-counsel? I think that they're going to make a decision between the two of them who's going to address the court and, and when. Uh, I'm not sure what, what your concern is. My concern, what, my concern um, is, is that the waste of time which is being proffered by defense counsel and originally playing this video if we're going to have numerous comment on the same legal issue in closing from both defense attorneys, Your Honor, I mean, the state has 
potentially 13 prosecutors who are well aware of Martinez Fuerte, who can all give their opinion and an educated opinion on that uh, since Martinez Fuerte was decided, I believe, in the late 70s. Um, it, it's a case that's well known. I, I could, I'm just trying to focus the inquiry and that one is You can't, trust me, I'm, I'm interested in making sure that this case moves along as is, 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 is quick as possible in the interest of justice. Once again, I mentioned before, the interest of time, in my opinion, is borderline violated at this point. So we got this whole day for this hearing, um, giving people an opportunity to, to just to, you know, have their their time to address the issues and I have full confidence in the two attorneys sitting in the defense counsel table, like I have full confidence in you that you're not gonna waste this court's time any longer. And Your Honor, um I drank, Ms. I drank Officer Jones's water. I apologize. Well, that is a violation of this courtroom. You <laughs> what can I say? Bring your own water. We'll, keep, we'll bring you more water. And, and feel free, the rest of you. This courtroom can can get really hot, um, especially when we have a lot of people. If you need more water, please. If you need any break, um, let me know. You ready to proceed, Mr. Katz? I am, Your Honor. Um, Agent Sims, can you state and spell your name for the record, please? My name is Mark Sims, M-A-R-K-S-I-M-S. And uh, who do you work for currently? I work for the United States Border Patrol. In what capacity are you a Border Patrol agent? I'm a supervisory canine instructor. And who do you supervise uh, with regard to the canine agents? Um, who are you responsible for? The canine handlers and their canines. Uh, which region of canine handlers? In the Yuma sector. Including and, all three stations within the Yuma sector. And the Yuma sector includes uh, which stations? Welton Station, the Yuma Station, and the Bly Station. At mile marker 78, is that considered the uh, Welton Station? It is, yes. And sir. you're responsible for that? Yes, sir. Um, can you briefly describe how you became a supervisor? Um, I, was in the board, I was in the Border Patrol for, uh, I've been in the Border Patrol for 13 years. Um, I became a canine handler seven years ago. I became a, a canine instructor shortly after that. So I've been an instructor for a little over six years in the canine program. And uh, I eventually became a supervisory position, came open, and I applied and I got the position. Do you teach new canine handlers uh, the procedures that are used at mile marker 78? Yes, I do. Um, <coughs> typically, do canine handlers go to a training session before they encounter your, um, your training? Right, before they arrive at the uh, sector, they do six weeks of canine training in El Paso, the canine center in El Paso. When they arrive at your sector, do you assign them to particular stations? Um, they're already assigned to stations by the time they get to me, but that's how they come here, sir. Um, what are the uh, canines trained to detect at mile marker 78? Of concealed people and the odors of narcotics. And is that every canine? That's every canine in the Border Patrol, yes, sir. At mile marker 78, excuse me. Now, every detection canine, the Border Patrol has different canines for different operations, but at the checkpoint, that's uh, their job. Do you supervise Gary Spoonamore? I do. Do you supervise Agent Griffiths? I do. Um, and how do they work? What, what are they employed as? They're employed as canine handlers at the checkpoint for the Welton Station. Uh, they're trained to find and look for terrorists and weapons of mass destruction um, undocumented aliens and narcotics trying to infiltrate into the U.S. there at the checkpoint at Welton. Is the primary purpose of those canine agents to find narcotics? primary purpose is to uh, prevent terrorists and weapons of mass destruction and then aliens and then narcotics as well. Um, can you kind of briefly explain how you supervise Agent uh, Spoonamore, for example, what your day-to-day -day supervi supervision entails? Day-to-day, um, -day, I'm, I'm not the real day-to-day -day supervisor. I help him with his canine training, and I help him with any issues that he has with the, with the canine, health-related and training and training issues. You can t do you provide continued canine training to Agent Spoonamore? Right. The canines receive maintenance training, which is every two weeks they get eight hours of training on the, on the orders in which they're trained to detect. And then um, I help them with any issues that they have at the checkpoint. Are you familiar with terms such as pre-primary and primary inspection? as it yes. relates to mile marker 78? Yes, sir. 
Um, what do you have your canine agents do in pre-primary? In pre-primary, in the pre-primary portion of the checkpoint, they conduct canine sniffs of vehicles as they approach the primary position of the checkpoint. So they, they will encounter the vehicle before the vehicle actually reaches the primary position. And how do they encounter the vehicle? What have you trained them to do? Um, they work the dog along the side of the vehicle to sniff the air coming around, around the outside of the vehicle as it passes through the pre-primary position before it arrives at the uh, primary position. And can you kind of explain where pre-primary is in relation to primary? Primary is where the vehicle comes to a stop and then is and then the agent that is in the primary position asks the questions, the immigration questions, and uh, um, it actually has contact with the individual driving the vehicle. Pre-primary is anything before that. How many pre-primaries are there at mile marker 78? Uh, there are two lanes, so there could be two different pre-primaries, but there's only pre-primary is a position prior to primaries. Okay, so pre-primary occurs in lane one and pre-primary occurs in lane two? Yes. And do canine agents go back and forth? Yes, sir, they do. And what is contingent upon how the agents go back and forth between those areas? Depending on the traffic. Um, if Sometimes they'll have completed a, a canine sniff of a vehicle in the one lane, and then the traffic will arrive in the other lane, and so they'll go to that lane. Or if there's only traffic in the other lane, then they'll go to that lane, but kind of traffic dictates. So you've uh, trained your canine agents to constantly be moving in pre-primary? Yeah, and in, in order to maximize the amount of time and the amount of people that we can get um, through there, we, we try to get them to work between both lanes. Are, are you familiar with the phrase canine alert? I am. What does that mean? Alert is a, is a change of body posture and increased respiration when the dog first encounters the odors he's been trained to detect. That means that um, you get that physical change when the dog finds what it is that he's looking for. Is the primary agent capable of knowing when the uh, canine alerts? The primary agent is, he's certified to see that. That's what, every year there's a certification and the primary, not the, not the primary agent, but the canine handler yes. is the um, one that is. My question is, if an agent is working primary, is he trained to know when the dog no. alerts? No, he's not. Um, if he's not trained to know when the dog alerts, how does he know that the canine's alerted? Um, the canine handler informs the primary agent that the canine is alerted. And how have you trained uh, some of your agents to inform the primary agent that a canine is alerted? Um, they'll show up, they'll put up two fingers or tell them to put it in secondary. Usually they'll just tell them to please place that vehicle into secondary. Or, or they'll hold up a two, which means secondary. It's a hand signal. It kind of differentiates between the handlers and the people that are working there. But generally it is uh, put that vehicle in secondary or hold up a two. Let the record reflect Agent Sims has held up two fingers to indicate. Um, now, after a dog's alerted, what have you trained your canine assistants to do then, or canine agents? Um, after the canine is alerted and the, um, the canine handler has informed the primary agent to place the vehicle in the secondary, um, the vehicle then goes from primary to secondary. Um, once in secondary, the canine handler um, asks the individual in the, in the vehicle um, for consent to conduct a canine sniff in the secondary position where it's more secure, and then to ask the people to get out of the vehicle. Um, the people generally get out of the vehicle and then go to a secure area and they conduct a second canine sniff on the vehicle and then um, we'll get consent to search or depending on kind of what happens um, we'll release the vehicle right away if they, you don't have a canine alert again in secondary once you've removed the people or um, or we'll continue to search or gather um, more evidence to, to figure out what's happened there what's going on in that position are you familiar with uh, some of the duties and responsibilities of primary agents the primary agents yes sir um, what are some of the reasons that primary agents can refer vehicles to secondary? Um, if they, if the person that's driving the vehicle is acting suspiciously or if he smells something, if he smells marijuana or, or just um, sees something that's out of order or something that gets his, uh, gives him any type of suspicion that there's something going on or missing in this vehicle, immigration related, drug related or anything, that person can then place the vehicle on the secondary. Typically, what's the first question or type of question that's asked by a primary agent? Maybe please state your citizenship or to have them give the citizenship or what country they are a citizen of. If you know, are primary agents trained to ask about narcotics initially? No. They're not, tra they're not trained to ask about narcotics right away, no. It's their training, from your knowledge, that they ask initially about citizenship? Yes, sir. 
Um, after vehicles refer to secondary on a dog alert, do primary agents assist at that point? Yes, sir. They'll, they'll help. Um, they'll help with uh, maintaining security of the people that are in the vehicle because you're having everybody get out, and so they'll help with that. And then uh, the canine handler will do pretty much the rest. Are you familiar with um, Agent Spoonmore's work performance? I am. Um, briefly, can you describe his work performance for the court? He's a, he's a good worker. He's uh, very good at what he does. Um, is he uh, competent at canine handling? He is. Um, have you viewed Agent Spoonamore uh, work lately? I have. Um, do you know the name of Agent Spoonamore's canine assistant? His, His uh, dog. His dog, Jerry. Okay. And how long has uh, Agent Spoonamore been with Jerry? Two, two years, I think. I, I don't know specific. I don't know the exact amount of time. And is Jerry um, certified by United States Border Patrol? Yes, he is. Has Jerry ever been removed from service, to your knowledge? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, are you familiar with the events of this case? <coughs> yes, roughly. Um, was Agent Spoonamore working on that particular night of August, excuse me, April 14th? Um, yes, he was. Okay. Um, was he working with Jerry? He was. Have you spoken with Agent Spoonamore about this case? Not too much. Um, your Honor, may I have a moment? Is the checkpoint at mile marker 78 in the jurisdiction of this court? Yes, it is. Do you know why the checkpoint was placed at mile marker 78? Um, op that's an operational thing at the station level. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly what their reasoning was for putting it there, but at the station level, it's an operational decision. Okay. I have no further questions for this witness. Thank you, Judge. Judge, could I uh, use the podium? You may. I don't know if this one moves or not. I guess you'll find out. But yes. I, I, I think that uh, it does if, if you I want break, to. If I break something, I'm sure Mr. Katz will be happy to fix it or pay for the... I don't think that will be the case. No. I will be happy, though. All right. Thank you, I Judge. That should be the main concern. I'll do my best to keep you happy, Judge. I'm not paying... And Mr. Victor, I appreciate, I think for purposes of the record, that is the best approach, the, uh, the podium. Oh, thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Morning, Agent Sims. Good morning, sir. Agent Sims, you testified that uh, mile marker 78 is within the jurisdiction of this court. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What is the jurisdiction of this court? You want to count? Okay. Uh, and so this is all of Yuma County is within the jurisdiction of this court? Um, I'm not entirely positive about this specific court, but I'm assuming that as county court, the entire county would be in within that court's jurisdiction. Yes, sir. Okay, so do you know if we are in the jurisdiction of Yuma or if we're in the jurisdiction of Welton in terms of this courtroom right here that you're in? This court, um, I'm not sure you can can you rephrase the question? Are we in Are we in the Yuma Justice Court? Are we in the Welton Justice Court? Do you know which Justice Court we're in right here? We're in Yuma Justice Court. Okay. And so uh, your testimony is that Mayo Marker 78 is within the jurisdiction of the Yuma Justice Court. Is that right? There's a Welton Justice Court. It should be in that. Uh, it should be in the Welton Justice Court's um, jurisdiction, but it got transferred to this court. So I assumed that this court would then have jurisdiction. Okay. Would it be accurate to say you're not really sure what the jurisdiction is for mile marker 78? Mile marker 78 is within the Welton's jurisdiction, but this court has taken over this case, so it is within this jurisdiction. All right. Officer Sims, uh, were you working out at the uh, checkpoint on April 14th of this year? No, sir. So uh, to the extent you know anything about what happened out there, uh, and when I say out there, I mean when Mr. Anderson or Pastor Anderson was coming through the checkpoint, to the extent you know anything about what happened, uh, none of that is your personal knowledge. Is that right? That is correct. So everything you know, uh, you were told to by other agents who were there on the scene. Is that right? For this specific incident, sir. 